I'd like to introduce uh, today's presenters. Uh, we'll start with uh, Pepper Sanchez Lucia. He's project manager at ICF International. He has 18 years of experience in conducting policy analysis and providing program support, primarily for federal, state transportation agencies. In his nine years with ICF, he has provided almost continuous support to the offices of USDOT and has contributed to multiple research projects for the Transportation Research Board. He has also been supported by several high-profile transportation initiatives, including Federal Highways, Everyday Counts Initiative, the Federal Partnership for Sustainable Communities, and the National Surface Transportation Policy and Re Revenue Study Commission. Prior to joining ICF, Pepper was a legislative assistant for the U.S. Congress, first for the Congressional Budget Office and then for the House Budget Committee. He holds a master's degree in public affairs from Princeton University. Our second speaker uh, is Bethany Whitaker. She's a principal with Nelson Nygaard Consulting Associates. She has more than 20 years of experience in transit planning, ranging from planning and design services for rural and small urban systems to large system redesign studies. She's also experienced in human service transportation planning and coordination studies and has recently the project manager for two statewide transportation projects. Bethany has a Master of Public Policy, Evans School of Public Affairs, University of Washington in Seattle, and a Bachelor of Arts cum laude from History and Chinese Studies from Tufts University. So with that, let me go ahead and open the presentation. And Pepper and Bethany, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Phil, you can hear me okay? Yes. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, um, Happy to be uh, online to chat with you today about our, our research project uh, run by the uh, Transportation Research Board on, on behalf of the uh, AASHTO Standing Committee on Public Transportation. Just uh, want to quickly uh, just give you an overview of, of our presentation today. First, we'll summarize the research project's purpose and the timeline and the methodology we use. Then we will uh, focus in on the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that we concluded are most relevant to public transit. Following that, we will uh, delve a little deeper into public transit's involvement in the Medicaid program, and then we will share the results of one of the five case studies we prepared. And lastly, we'll hopefully have some time for questions and answers. Uh, in this project, uh, was conducted in uh, April, from April 2011 to June 2012. Uh, for those of you who can't remember back that far, uh, the Affordable Care Act was enacted in March 2010. So our research uh, started about a year after the Affordable Care Act had been passed. But as you um, probably sent from the current news, this was well before the hard work of implementing the Affordable Care Act had, had really kicked in. Um, so what we did for this research project was, first of all, uh, quickly assess and summarize the pre-existing laws and rules governing how public transit participates in healthcare-related transportation. That involved looking at uh, current Medica Medicaid rules as well as uh, ADA paratransit. Uh, rules and, and the interactions between those two programs. Then we did a, a separate analysis of the Affordable Care Act, looking for the provisions most relevant to transit. After that, we went out and talked to folks in five different transit agencies, and, and as well as state uh, DOTs and Medicaid, uh, state Medicaid programs to get a sense of how the Affordable Care Act might impl uh, affect them. And the last part of the research project was to offer suggestions on how public transit could monitor and communicate the impacts that the Affordable Care Act was having on them. So getting into the substance of the research, uh, why should public transit care about the uh, federal health care reform? Well, this is probably a really obvious question to us all now. Uh, this just this month we're watching uh, the Obamacare or the health care exchanges being rolled out or not rolled out, as the case may be. Uh, everyone's, so everyone's keenly aware of how 
significant the Affordable Care Act is in terms of changing how Americans obtain health care coverage. At the time that it was enacted, it was estimated that as many as 32 million Americans would uh, be able to obtain health insurance coverage. About half of that 16 million were expected to uh, obtain coverage through an expansion of the Medicaid program. Uh, we will uh, talk more about that uh, in just a few minutes. And just the reason we're focusing on, we focused on Medicaid and is that the, although it only accounts for a small percentage of all Medicaid spending, the portion, the, uh, the sum that Medicaid program spends on human services transportation, about two to three billion dollars annually, is the federal government's largest funding source for human services transportation. <clears throat> so we've all, uh, like as I mentioned, we've all uh, seen in the news that the uh, health benefit exchanges have been opened and people are searching for options uh, for health care coverage. That is one of the central features of the Affordable Care Act. And the other, another major feature is the expansion of Medicaid eligibility that I just alluded to. Um, back it, behind that and also very controversial is the individual mandate that uh, requires people to obtain coverage or face tax penalties. And we noted that these were all relevant to public transit because people who obtain health insurance coverage who haven't had it previously have been shown to uh, take advantage of that health insurance coverage by uh, seeking more uh, more office visits, more visits to uh, health care facilities to the extent that people are dependent on transit or use transit for those trips. So that's uh, an impact of the Affordable Care Act on transit. There were also provisions in the law that we saw that were meant to increase the availability of health care services in underserved areas, uh, incentives for rural health providers, health care providers, more funding for community health centers, and probably not noted as uh, widely as some of these other provisions, there were provisions in the law to reduce the incidence of health care fraud, so more reporting and, and data collection requirements uh, that will ultimately fall on providers of uh, Medicaid-funded services, including transit, uh, transit agencies that are participating in uh, the transportation funded by Medicaid. Uh, I guess I should just back up one, real quick and say that as we looked over the provisions uh, all the various provisions that we identified as being relevant to public transit, uh, and we thought about the, you know, the scope of the of the research project. We decided to focus in on the Medicaid expansion because of the direct participation of transit agencies in, in providing transportation for Medicaid participants. In addition, we concluded that this provision was of interest and relevant to the greatest number of, of transit agencies. So. For the rest of our presentation and, and, the rest, and our research report are, are focused on, on the Medicaid-related portions of the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> um, very quickly, the Medicaid expansion, as it was originally written in the Affordable Care Act, uh, was to provide offer Medicaid to nearly everyone under the age of 65, up to 133% of the federal poverty line. And states were initially required to go along with this expansion or risk losing other Medicaid funds. To sweeten the pot a little bit, the federal government is picking up 100% of the cost of expanding Medicaid, at least in the initial few years, with, and then uh, in the out years, the reimbursement from the federal government drops to 90 percent. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling in June 2012 said that states could opt out of the Medicaid expansion without losing, uh, without risking their existing Medicaid funding. 
And <clears throat> this map that um, I, is from the advisory board company, a health consulting company, shows where states, what states have decided to do with the flexibility offered by the Supreme Court ruling. So in this map, the blue states are states that have this, are participating in the Medicaid expansion. Uh, the light blue are states leaning in that direction. Red are the states not participating. Uh, the lighter red states leaning toward not participating. And purple uh, states that are considering other expansion models. So you've got 20 states committed to participating, 15 commit, um, not participating at this time, and then others sort of somewhere in the middle. In our research, um, was largely conducted before the Supreme Court ruling came out. Uh, so we were able to at least to tailor the, our final report a little bit to, re to reflect this, this ruling. Uh, the next slide I have here shows how the state decisions to date are, are affecting the, the number of people who will ultimately have the ability to enroll in Medicaid. And what it's showing is that at least half of the people who were initially expected to enroll in Medicaid uh, will not have that option because they're located in states that have chosen not to participate in the expansion. Uh, as I mentioned, our, our research was completed largely before the Supreme Court um, issued this ruling. Um, despite this, we continue to believe that the Medicaid expansion is relevant, especially to public transit agencies in those states that are participating. And more generally, the, the role of public transit in the provision of Medicaid uh, non-emergency medical transportation is an important issue, regardless of whether uh, a state has decided to participate in the Medicaid expansion. So we've alluded, I've alluded to uh, Medicaid uh, funding for transportation services, so now I just I'm going to give um, a few slides to describe that service and to talk about how transit's involved in that. And, and um, I'll be turning the presentation over to uh, my co-author, Bethany Whitaker, to go over one of our case studies. Uh, Medicaid, under federal Medicaid regulations, uh, each state's Medicaid plan must specify that the administering state agency will ensure necessary transportation for Medicaid recipients to and from uh, providers. And the reason behind this is that uh, trans lack of transportation is, has been shown to be a barrier for low-income individuals and an obstacle to them for uh, obtaining the lower-cost non-emergency medical services. And so the Medicaid program has laid out requirements for uh, this, what we call NEMT, or non-emergency medical transportation. Uh, it includes routine trips to medical appointments, as well as trips that are urgent, but, but not emergency in nature, so um, trips not requiring uh, ambulance. States are given a certain degree of flexibility in, in how they choose to provide non-emergency medical transportation. Uh, for example, the states can cap the number of trips uh, a person can, um, can take uh, on Medicaid dollars uh, on a monthly or even annual basis. States have adopted a number of different models for delivering this non-emergency medical transportation and the opportunities for participation by public transit agencies is different in each of these models. In some cases, public transit agencies are serving as NEMT brokers by which uh, they are uh, receiving calls from Medicaid participants requesting transportation, they're checking for eligibility, they're looking 
uh, to find the least cost, most appropriate transportation provider in assigning the trip. Uh, many more uh, public transit agencies are actually uh, being con um, participating in the NEMT uh, programs as trip providers. One one thing that has been happening in the, the field or area of Medicaid and EMT is that a number of states have shifted to private for-profit brokerages. Sometimes these are regional brokers or sometimes they're statewide brokers, but in every case, this shift to a um, this type of brokerage has uh, affected how public transit agencies participate in the state and EMC programs. So our hypothesis was that with such a large increase in the Medicaid population that we that it's possible you Medicaid programs would see an increased demand for these non emergency medical transportation trips. And that the efforts to control the cost of an EMT could result in more trip of these trips being uh, shifted to public transit. So we um, we did five case studies. We talked to the tra transit agencies, state DOTs, and uh, most of the public transportation offices within the state DOT and with the state Medicaid programs. Again, this is early days for the Affordable Care Act, but we talked to them about their expectations for the increase in the number of NEMT trips and any plans they were making to manage that increase. And we also asked them for suggestions on tools and data that could be used to the impact of the Affordable Care Act on transit. And with that, I uh, will um, turn uh, things over to Bethany. Okay, thanks, Pepper. So we, we, um, the first thing that we did before, we, as we were getting started with the case study research, was to identify where we wanted to do the case studies. And we took a lot of things into consideration, including states that were going to see a, a large increase in Medicaid populations, and then we wanted a geographic spread and range of settings, and we wanted to also sample from different service delivery models. So some states that use public transit brokers to administer um, NEMT and some that use private sector brokerages, some different statewide brokerages as well as regional models. And then the only exception in this rule was Massachusetts, and that's also the case study that we are going to talk about today. And one of the reasons why we included Massachusetts is because that they have essentially gone through health care reform already, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So you can see we had um, five case studies, we, Bismarck, Mon uh, North Dakota, Jackson, Mississippi, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, um, which is um, one of the suburban cities in Massachusetts, um, Whatcom County in Bellingham, Washington, and then the Southwest Regional Commission in Georgia. And then as Pepper was saying, one of the things we thought we would do today with today's webinar is spend a little bit more time telling you about one case study rather than giving you um, sort of an overview of all of the case studies that we did. So one of the things, you know, just sort of backing up a little bit and talking about what Massachusetts as a state has done and how this has impacted the way that they provide NEMT and also the transit agency's role in the provision of that service. As most of you guys know, Massachusetts went through their own health care reform at a state level in 2006, and their health care reform um, process became a model for the Affordable Care Act in many ways. It's not exactly the same, but several of the things that Massachusetts did, the federal government also did. And the impact of that health care reform, you know, how many people were affected by that is a very political number. Um, one of the larger numbers that I saw that came from the Census Bureau was around 400,000 people received health care, health insurance as a result of the health care reform. And again, you know, you can you find a lot of different estimates on that, but some were as low as 40,000. But I think suffice to say there were a large number of people that were affected by ACA. And then the question is, um, how many of those, what impact did that have on the demand for NEMT and how did transit agencies get involved with that? Um, so uh, because Massachusetts already did health care reform, the impact from ACA is not expected to be significant. We're talking about 2 to 5 percent 
increase in enrollment and really between 30 and 75,000 individuals. So ACA is not going to have a, a giant impact on them, but again, they have gone through a lot of this already. Um, another thing about Massachusetts that is somewhat unique and somewhat interesting as well is that they have a, a human service transportation office at the state level. So they have a staff of maybe, I don't know, it's 12 to 15, up to 20 people that work on human service transportation issues. That office is in the executive office of HHS. So they have dedicated resource, and as a result of this, they have very good data. Um, so that also makes them attractive case study and something that's interesting to look at um, as part of this webinar. And then another thing about Massachusetts that's somewhat unique is they have a regional brokerage model, and they have public transportation operators are dedicated uh, are um, identified as the brokers. So the only people that can bid on the NEMT contracts are public transit operators. But a public transit operator can bid on an NEMT contract outside of its own service area. So if you're on, you know, Boston can bid on a, an EMT contract in the western part of the state or vice versa. So um, the Human Service Transportation Office manages a bunch of human service transportation programs, including NEMT, and then also some Department of Developmental Services, Public Health, and some other programs. They do not do ADA paratransit service, but they do do a lot of the human service transportation. As a result, they have a a very coordinated service delivery model, and they're able to, you'll see that they'll be able to achieve some efficiency. Um, here's the brokerage they system, kind of an overview. They broke it up into eight areas. I think they have uh, about five different, um, five different brokers. One of the things our case study is um, going to focus on the Monachusett Area uh, Regional Transit Authority. This is their geographic location, but you can see they have contracts in a lot of other parts of the state, including the Boston metro area. And then, as I mentioned, um, the Human Service Transportation Office for the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, they collect a lot of data, and they collect, and this just shows you some of their trip rates and trip costs, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. So um, in terms of using transit for non-emergency medical transportation, that is not some, that is, hasn't been a hallmark of the Massachusetts experience. They do use the transit operators function primarily as brokers and less as service providers. Um, about four, just over 4% of the human service transportation trips are on the fixed route transit system. So that means that they're providing a lot of service through paratransit type vehicles and um, more dial-a-ride demand response kind of um, services. But one of the interesting things about their model, and again, we'll talk about this, is that they have been able to control costs even as demand has increased. Um, and this, so this graphic, you know, the state of Massachusetts has tracked trip volume every single year, and they also issue the contracts based on trip costs. One of the trends that we have seen, and I think a lot of you on the call have seen, is that for Medicaid to pay for trips based on a per member per month basis, and, and Massachusetts has not gone that route. It has, it's, it negotiates with the brokers at the beginning of the year for a trip cost. That's an average trip cost. They will revisit it if costs are too high or too low, but they use that average trip cost for their contracts, and then um, you can see that they have been able to, the volumes have increased pretty significantly over the years, but trip costs have been relatively flat. Um, so what Monachusett Regional Transit Authority, as I mentioned, is sort of in the northwestern part of the state, um, north central, I guess, if you're on the slide. So they are one of the brokers, and they are the largest broker in the system, and they're responsible for about 70% of the services, primarily because they have the Boston metro area, but they do provide service in rural, urban, and suburban areas, and they have an annual budget of almost $70 million. So you can imagine it's quite a big program. Um, they're responsible for arranging trips, contracting, doing service quality, um, developing the routing and tracking and performance measure and monitoring performance measures. So they have a lot of um, interesting, what I, we, we call them um, best practices, and some of these are things that the state does and some of these are the things that the broker does, and we're just kind of presenting them combined. Hope it makes sense to everyone. Um, in terms of one of the best practices is cost sharing. So as I mentioned, the HST office at the state level, that's, uh, they agree on a cost per trip, 
And if the broker is able to provide a trip for a lower rate than that, they're allowed to keep up to 3% of the program cost. And this has been a really um, positive ex um, program element for the brokers. And remember, the brokers are public transit operators, so the money's getting – there is a requirement that the profits or the, addition, the remaining revenues are reinvested into the system. And MART, in particular, has used a lot of that, those resources to update and develop new software programs. That has allowed them to manage their brokerage models even as they become larger and they have more service providers and they're adding more um, performance metrics that they have to keep track of. But because, because they are allowed to keep some revenues that they're able to generate from being more efficient they, and invest those back into the system, it has had a very positive effect on their ability to continue to be very efficient. Another best practice has been a real emphasis on monitoring service quality, and the vendors um, provide a lot of performance standards. I showed a lot of slides in the beginning that had a lot of data on them. Those, that information comes from the brokers. The brokers are monitored by the state, and then the state does a lot of, uh, and the brokers do a lot of monitoring of their service providers. And the commitment to service quality has been something that they track and they measure and that they put a lot of emphasis on. Um, so coming back to the Affordable Care Act and thinking about how the Affordable Care Act is going to affect the Massachusetts Regional Transit Authority, um, they will have increased reporting requirements. And this was something that we found in our other case studies people had different opinions about, but because um, Massachusetts is, they have an established system, they're not afraid of um, adding more performance metrics. They, can, they have an extensive software system. They're able to adjust that, and as a result, they're prepared to collect additional data if need to. And, it, and likewise, because they have a per-trip rate that is a cost that includes their costs and is something that they are able to deliver within, they are also available to increase volumes. So they can add volumes, add trips. They have a network of service providers who are willing to provide trips at that for that cost, and so. If the volumes go up, they can provide more trips. If the volumes go down, they can provide less trips. Um, so they have this ability to increase capacity. It's very market-driven. And as I mentioned, they have extensive tracking and monitoring systems that are also dynamic. Um, so as a result, when we talked to um, Montachusett about the Affordable Care Act, they were ready to, pro to provide additional trips. They felt that they were well positioned to meet the demands. They um, they had a lot of confidence going forward, and they were, you know, I think it was just they were ready to go. And if more people signed up, they were able to meet those volumes, and so they were prepared to play a larger role in um, any MT if need be, or or not, depending on what happened in Massachusetts. So, Pepper, I think I'll turn it back to you for a summary of findings. Okay, yeah, and I think, um, thank you, Bethany. Another interesting point to be made about the uh, Boston or Massachusetts example is that we were, uh, we were able to get data from the Human Service Transportation Office and look at how um, NEMT ride trips uh, changed over the course of the implementation of health care reform in Massachusetts. And while there were increases in the number of NEMT trips, there were the rate of increase was actually slower than uh, the rate at which other human service uh, trips were increasing. So while we went in expecting that we would have seen a large increase in uh, NEMT trips, and, and there was an increase. It, it wasn't, in fact, uh, increases on the same scale as, as Massachusetts was seeing in, in uh, its other human service transportation programs. So but that data sort of flew, uh, ran counter to our hypothesis that, uh, that this increase in the Medicaid population was going to directly translate into um, more trips or uh, a high rate of increase in, in any MT trip. Um, you know, it's hard in a, in a short webinar like this to uh, sum up uh, the case, all the case studies, and so we didn't even try. But we can tell you a little bit more 
uh, about what we heard from the other states and the other transit agencies. Uh, again, we were doing this work uh, just within the first year, 18 months of the uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and both state Medicaid programs and state DOT said that they either hadn't really thought very much about how the Affordable Care Act was going to affect their NENT programs, or they were comfortable with the ability, with their ability to scale up the number of providers or the number of trips that they were um, that they were able to um, broker or manage. One point that was brought up is that the new Medicaid participants are going to be higher higher income individuals or families and have fewer disabilities than those who are already enrolled in Medicaid and that was mentioned as uh, a reason why NEMT trips may not increase uh, as much as the actual population of the Medicaid programs increase. Is the individuals will have more ability. They, uh, the rate of high of their rate of automobile ownership will be higher, or they'll have more resources at their own disposal to to get them uh, back and forth to healthcare appointments. Uh, as we've mentioned, there is a lot of uh, change going on now in how NEMT programs are being administered by states. Um, I mentioned the shift to for-profit uh, brokers, and the state Medicaid offices that we spoke to said that the Affordable Care Act was not likely to change their decisions about how <clears throat> they chose to manage the uh, NEMT programs. We did hear from transit agencies about concerns with how NEMT was managed within their state or in their region, uh, but these concerns were not specific to the Affordable Care Act. Basically, what we found is uh, that with our research was not so much that the we expected to see a tidal wave of size impact from the Affordable Care Act on public transit, but just that this expansion of Medicaid that's uh, built into the law really shines a, a, a spotlight on ongoing issues that public transit has with the uh, with Medicaid and the NT. We didn't we didn't hit this point uh, earlier in our. Uh, Presentation, but there is an um, ongoing issue of uh, Medicaid trips being shifted over to ADA uh, paratransit trip uh, service that's provided by public public transit agencies, and there is um, there are issues of how much reimbursement uh, per trip uh, transit agencies should get when they are providing. Um, a Medicaid on this trip through their paratransit service. And again, the trend towards statewide private brokerages that are paid on a, on a per member per month basis uh, does incentivize them to to use transit. <clears throat> um, but you know, in some cases, these brokerages have not really. Um, uh, really made a lot of outreach efforts to the public transit agencies in their in the states where they're operating. Before we open up for questions, I just wanted to note that there is a another uh, another research related research effort that will be getting underway. The award is expected sometime in the next few weeks. It's a, a separate. PCRP project that will be examining the effects of separate NEMT brokerages on, on transportation coordination. So, again, we, we didn't mention it specifically, but there's a, a lot of been a lot of effort at the federal and state levels to and local levels 
uh, to coordinate human services transportation and to uh, try to create efficiencies from the sharing of, of trips and vehicles uh, across the different programs. And with the rise of separate MEMT brokerages, the coordination of other trips with Medicaid NEMT, NEMT trips is becoming more difficult. And uh, this is, will be an 18-month research effort that we'll be looking more specifically at, at that issue. And let's see, the last slide I want to show just is uh, where you can uh, obtain the, the full report if you're interested in looking at it. It's available for free at the CRB website, and I believe these slides are available for download uh, from the, within my live meeting here, so you don't have to drop down this link. Uh, you can also always keyword search at the CRB site. So with that, still, um, we're happy to open this uh, webinar up for question and answers. All right, great. Thank, thank you, Pepper. Thank you, Bethany. And um, as you mentioned, Pepper, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, people should see what looks like three sheets of paper. If you click on that, you'll be able to download a copy of uh, today's presentation as a PDF. And uh, just as another reminder, this, this session has been recorded and will be available playback uh, probably by Monday. And uh, check the Cutter website for more information. So. With that, let me pull up of how to ask a question, how to submit your question. Uh, if you come out of the left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see uh, an area to click on Q&A. You type in your message in this area, click the Ask, and uh, that will be submitted, and we'll pull questions from that. Um, I know we have some coming in already, and so let's go ahead and get started. First one is, do you have any recommendations for what uh, transit agencies could do to be more active in the NEMT market? Yeah, um, definitely I'll, I'll let you answer that one. Okay. Um, yeah, so there was a that – that's a good question. Um, there are a number of things that transit agencies could do to get – to be more active in the NEMT market. I would, in especially using Massachusetts and the Massachusetts Regional Transit Authority as an example, um, steady, uh, working with other human service transportation organizations and establishing a track record. We also found this in our case studies, the transit agencies that were already working with human service transportation agencies were more likely to be involved with NEMT. They also had some services and skills that they could bring to an NEMT broker and or and to be a service provider. Another key thing was having a set rate um, or a trip rate that they knew was advantageous, not advantageous, but reasonable for them. So um, and some people call them agency rates or set trip rates, but some kind of trip rate that includes their allocated cost. So they can talk to the Medicaid broker and say, this is how much it costs to use our paratransit service especially. Um, and if you would like to buy trips, this is, you know, this is what we charge. And having that rate and being very active about reaching out to the broker and talking with them can be good strategies to um, kind of get into the market. Do you have anything to add, Pepper? Uh, no. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, next question is actually it starts out as it may not be within the scope of your research, but they, they would like to at least submit and see what your opinion is. In Washington State, our transit agencies are reimbursed only the fare, not the cost of the trip, which are typically more expensive than fixed route trips. This is consuming more and more of the transit agency budget and has created some real financial inequity issues. We also missed an opportunity to leverage federal funds. Did you find this in other states? Will the um, ACA help provide any relief to transit, transit agencies on this issue? Or will it just make things worse? Uh, again, Bethany, I'll, I'll give you first. Uh... Okay. Sure. So that's a, that's a great question, and I think it sort of relates to what I was trying to explain when I answered the first question. And, yes, it's a very common problem where NEMT 
reimburses transit agencies the fare rather than the cost of service. If we're talking about a fixed route trip, that's that's fine, that's appropriate, and I think that's also what the legislation says, not the healthcare legislation, but uh, um, but in terms of the paratransit trips, that can be, or the fix, demand responsive trips, that's a different animal, and paying $1.25 or even $2 for a trip that might cost you $30 to provide is a losing proposition. So there, I don't think the legislation itself, per se, is going to have an impact on that. There's we don't know. We haven't seen a lot of rulemaking. I don't know, you know, how long it will take them to get to that level of detail for this program. But one of the things, as I was mentioning earlier or trying to mention earlier, um, the extent that you can negotiate an agency fare that either is a set fare that, you know, for most of your trips is a break-even fare or is you can negotiate to provide a costly allocated fare, that's where other agencies have had success. And again, if you're providing a trip for a senior center and you're charging $15 for that trip, then you also are building a track record and sort of a case for why you should also be providing Medicaid trips for that fare, you know, a fare that is fully allocated or negotiated at some level so you're not losing, you know, most of the trip cost to Medicaid. Another thing that I wanted to mention, and we saw this in some other states, was Transit agencies can protect themselves a little bit if they don't do things like sell um, ADA paratransit passes or books of trick tickets because sometimes if people have a, a pass to use ADA, unlimited pass to use ADA, they, that makes it easier for them to use it for Medicaid trips or for other types of trips that they could be funded from different sources and likewise books of tickets. So you, I think that there's a lot of policies that transit agencies really need to look at and think about and see, you know, if they're making it easy for people to use their services, even if they have funding so other funding sources, and, you know, how they can be active and proactive about setting policies to, to make sure that they do get fully allocated rates when they get, they get paid what they need to provide this service. But that's a big question. Um, we get something that we see all the time. All right. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how have transit agencies dealt with CMS requirement for money to follow the person? For example, it's been very difficult for Medicaid patients to use transit passes, which can be used for multiple trips, because it doesn't allow, it doesn't show a paper trail for using transit for a specific medical business. Uh, this is Paul Burr. I uh, Bethany has the uh, experience of, of working directly with uh, with transit agencies um, across the country. I'll just say that our case study of the Whatcom Trans Transit Authority in uh, Washington State uh, highlights their use of uh, transit passes to uh, for Medicaid participants, and I believe it involved. Uh, demonstrating or documenting that that person was going to be taking enough medical trips in the coming months to make it cost-effective and appropriate to give them a transit path. Uh, but I know that this, this has been an issue. Uh, we allude to uh, a Rhode Island ruling from CMS um, in, in, in the report, and uh, I'll uh, ask Bethany to set it what she wants to do about this issue. Yeah, so I would just reiterate that it is a very another one of those issues that we hear a lot and there's no easy answer for. And it's also one of those things that it, it doesn't really make sense um, because a, a fixed route transit trip is so much less exp um, expensive than one trip on a demand response service. Oftentimes a whole monthly pass is less expensive than a single trip on the demand response but Medicaid is fairly clear that they will not subsidize any other services or any other travel. So they make it really difficult for NEMT trips to be on, made on transit, especially if you have to confirm that the trip was made and do some kind of verification. I have not, I don't have any examples that I have come across where people have sort of solved this problem. They have dealt with it in different ways, having people sign a piece of paper or, um, 
sign a, a sheet that the driver has, but all of those ways are kind of band-aids, and in many cases, the administrative costs start to outweigh um, the benefits. So this, I think this is something that, you know, deserves more attention and that if, you know, as soon as we can find the best practice, we need to get it out there as soon as possible because getting um, any MT riders to use fixed route transit is a goal that helps everyone. Um, just the reporting requirements make it very difficult. All right. Thank you. We have, uh, I think, time for uh, two more questions. Um, do the agencies foresee an increase in transportation needs for homeless clients now eligible for Medicaid, methadone clients in particular? Uh, this right. I don't remember that coming up as part of uh, any of our discussions. Um, there, Bethany, I believe in Massachusetts we did talk with uh, the head of the Human Service Transportation Office about uh, those clients who need regular trips, uh, such as dialysis, methadone, but um, uh, anything you can add here would... Sure. sure. Yeah, I guess in my experience a little bit not directly or only from this study would be that most people that are participating in a Medicaid program, uh, methadone program are already on Medicaid, and so ACA won't necessarily increase the number of people that have access to that to that program. You know, again, I think, you know, as I'm saying that, I'm questioning it, but, um, yeah, Massachusetts did not see a huge increase, and then how the states implement is really remains to be seen, but, um, yeah. Massachusetts didn't experience it, and people that are already on methadone treatment program are already on Medicaid. So whether there's other addicts out there that will participate in the program, we're not sure if there are going to be large volumes of those individuals or not. Okay, and uh, I think the, the last question we have for today is um, actually, is there a role for state DOTs in facilitating transit agency participation in Medicaid and EMT? I'll take a first crack at that. I, um, I had a great conversation with uh, a woman in, in the North Dakota Department of Transportation, and she uh, had previously been in, in Kentucky. And in both places, she was actively involved in the in interacting with the Medicaid state Medicaid program on behalf of the public transit agencies and also in the establishment of regional brokerages that would help coordinate transportation for uh, different human service transportation um, programs. And so I definitely think there is a role for, for state DOTs to help uh, negotiate uh, and help um, the Medicaid programs establish policies that uh, that benefit public transit agencies and Stephanie. Uh, yeah, I would just add that in one of the earlier questions about getting fully allocated, the fully allocated cost for trips. So again, it's about sort of um, having the NEMT brokers use public, use demand response service and pay a public transit fare. The state DOTs can be in, get involved with that. Um, I think that's a good issue for state DOTs to get involved with. They you know, have a lot to do with transit, the provision of transit service in most states, and then Medicaid is also a state office. So the extent that those two agencies can work together to help transit agencies solve that problem and develop policies to address that head-on would be a great role for state DOCs. Okay. Well, um, Pepper and Bethany, thank you very much for a real interesting and informative presentation today and for the attendees thank you for coming and if you if you would take a, a minute to complete the online app, um, evaluation of today's session it will help us as we move forward and again on behalf of the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida we wish you a great rest of your day thank you goodbye